to the DMA webinar series. Thank you for joining us. Today we'll be talking about managing global VAT and how to implement a tax engine for VAT. Uh, my name is Angela Schrock. I'm a senior director with DMA's practice development. And today we're very excited to have a joint webinar with DMA and our partner Vertex. So we have fantastic presenters today. We have Peter Borhoff from Vertex as well as Angelo Torres from DMA, and they'll be leading the webinar today. So DMA has served our clients as state and local tax advisors in the U.S. and Canada for nearly 50 years. A few years ago, we expanded our practice into international tax, including both VAT and customs and duties. And we are excited to, uh, to announce that we did open our, inter our second international office uh, in Hamburg, Germany. So we are a proudly employee-owned company, and our goal is to serve as an extension of the tax department. We partner with our clients to provide tax minimization, uh, cost recovery, uh, and, and uh, knowledge transfer, which of course is what we're here to do today. Um, we do work in a number of different areas outside of the VAT area that are listed there under our, our, our tax focuses. Um, but today, again, of course, we are very specifically looking into VAT for the implementation of tax engines. And this just gives you a, a, an idea of where we're located. Um, our US office uh, is in uh, Indiana. The Canadian office is up in Toronto. And of course, as I mentioned, Amber, Germany is our, our, our new international office. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Peter to talk a little bit about Vertex. Yeah, thank you, uh, Angela. I'm Peter Borov. I'm the Fed Director within Vertex. I'm based in the Netherlands near Amsterdam. Um, and before joining Vertex, I was the global Fed director with Action Nobel, which is one of the larger Dutch multinationals. Um, Vertex is um, uh, in starting US-based, founded already um, a few decades ago, focusing solely on indirect tax automation. And we are now having a global expansion as well in Europe. We already have presence in London for um, approximately 10 years, but we're now really expanding into different offices in the UK, Ireland, Belgium, the Netherlands, of course, Germany and Sweden. And our staff is growing almost every day. We're now at approximately 60 people focusing on research, sales, but also like myself, more on, on tax content and um, uh, business development. And we have uh, quite an extensive practice in, in the US, over 50% of the Fortune 500 um, trust Vertex as their indirect tax automation. And also in Europe, we have an increasing number of customers, um, currently over 250 um, customers in Europe. Oh yeah. Angela. Thank you all very much for joining this call. Thank you very much for joining this webinar. My name is Angelo Torres. I'm a managing director at, at DMA. I uh, am the US VAT leader and at DMA we focus on compliance, advisory services and tax technology. For today, we're gonna to focus on tax technology. We're gonna focus on how do you impact, how do you in, in implement a tax engine from a VAT point of view? But before we start there, maybe I give you also some background on the Vertex and DMA relationship. It's been a very strong relationship, a strategic relationship for the last 20 years, whereby DMA has implemented for more than 120 Vertex solutions in the last three years. Part of those implementations uh, involved a global Vertex implementations from North America to LATAM to EMEA to APAC. And yeah, that relationship between Vertex and DMA is so strong that it's also a strategic uh, uh, relationship from a leadership point of view. We have our DMA leadership speaking to Vertex leadership regularly. And as DMA, we also sponsor the Vertex Exchange Conference. So for the agenda for today, we're going to go through the tax engine, and for that first to think about what's the current VAT calculation environment in the world. Then we're gonna go through yeah, what is a tax engine for VAT? 
what do we mean with that? What, what, you sh what should you consider? And then think about the business considerations to implement a tax engine, and then the actual implementation considerations. When we go through the implementation consideration, we will go through the pitfalls, the key aspects to consider, and an explanation on the general approach during an implementation. I'll turn it out oh, before I turn it to Peter. Let me just ask you all the first polling question. We like to understand our audience a bit better. And for that purpose, we like to know that who are the inner tax technology stakeholders in your organization? Is that IT, tax department, procurement, accounting finance, business services, Swiss suite, or other? And I'm wondering, Peter, yeah, when you are going through such an implementation, who are your stakeholders that you work with? Yeah, traditionally, if, if you look at this, this is usually driven or initiated by, by tax or by, by the VAT manager. Um, traditionally, there are always close links between the tax department and finance, and often it's, it's both of a tax is part of the overall finance community. But over the years, you see an increasing importance of, of other departments, of course, starting with IT, um, because this is a technology deployment, so it should fit into the, the overall systems landscape. But if an organization has, has implemented more decentralized or outsourced models, you also have to deal with um, the operations of, of, for example, business services um, for part of the accounting activities to understand, well, okay, what's the impact of, for example, your AP processes? Yeah, yeah, makes totally sense for me, Peter. Thank you for that. Uh, let's share the results for a minute. So what do we see actually? We see that 81%, that's a lot, has uh, mentioned that it's the tax department that is the number one stakeholder when it comes to tax technology. That's a, a great fit, especially as we think about that these tax technology solutions are to be used by tax departments. So great that it's actually the tax department that right now gave their highest uh, rating over here. Thank you all. So let, then let's go to the next slides and maybe Peter, you can go through the current VAT calculation environment. Yeah, I will, I will discuss a bit of the, 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 the current VAT calculation environment and what's happening um, in business and also in the legislative environment. Uh, because over the years, uh, the EU VAT landscape has become increasingly complex from a few different angles. Um, from a VAT legislative perspective, we've seen a shift from simple legislation with only domestic transactions and exports to a complex legal environment with many specific rules for specific sectors or types of transactions. And often within the EU, these new rules are introduced as either a simplification or as a measure to fight a VAT fraud. In the most recent development is tightening the reporting requirements by extending soft T or introducing real-time reporting and mandatory invoicing models. At the same time, you also see things have changed in the way business is conducted. From simple direct transactions between two parties, gradually complex supply chains and drop shipments become common, with, with sometimes three or more parties involved. And let's of course not forget in this the rise of the e-commerce. And finally, the systems landscape. This has evolved from a one ERP per country uh, environment to global integrated systems with one or multiple ERPs connected to procurement expense and e-commerce systems. And the sad thing of this whole picture and this story is actually that these trends are not in sync. Yeah, if we focus a bit more on the VAT capabilities within SAP, this stretch becomes quite clear. The VAT determination functionality in SAP has not changed in the past 40 years. So this system is basically designed for domestic and export transactions. However, in those 40 years, like I mentioned, the VAT and business requirements have changed drastically. And to keep up with those changes, IT departments are forced to keep up with those changes and ensure they are properly hard-coded in SAP or covered through a manual process. 
And for the future, it should be expected that the VAT functionality will not change within the ERP environment, while VAT requirements still increase. And VAT content to be maintained in multiple systems. And in the long run, this is not a sustainable solution. A fact of life for many multinationals is that their business operations have globalized. Business decisions like centralization, outsourcing, offshoring, etc., have resulted in many functions and processes that are shifted globally. IT was one of the first functions to experience this. As a result, the traditional business control environment and tax control framework can no longer fully rely on local resources. And VAT managers need to, in, to, need to connect the dots globally. However, at the same time, there is an increasing need for speed. Frequent changes in VAT legislation need to be captured, tested, and implemented into a company's ERP rapidly. With a centralized tax function, that captures and communicates the new rules, IT being done in India and user acceptance testing by FinOps in Poland and India, how quickly can you comply with the new rules? Increased digital auditing by tax administrations implies that a central tax function needs to have rapid access to transactional data, contracts, etc. Is all of this information readily available at the central level? And here I have to admit, how many tax managers or VAT managers understand how ERP works and can also work with it themselves. If the VAT team in Poland prepares a VAT returns, is there still enough time in the process to align with the AP team in India to have some major AP invoices corrected? And how will real-time reporting affect all of this? By implementing the right tax technology that covers the end-to-end -end VAT process, a VAT manager can gain back control and assume accountability over the process. This also relieves the IT department for keeping systems up to date with frequent changes of global VAT rules. And finally, finance operations departments will likely experience less stress in case of tax audits. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for all that information. That's great background. Um, with that background and with those uh, concepts in back of your mind. Maybe you're going to talk a bit about what is a tax engine for VAT. But before we do that, uh, let's go to the next polling question, which is, uh, and maybe Michelle, you can open that question. It's which VAT activities fall under your responsibility? Is that VAT reporting, tax technology solutions, controversy relating to VAT, are you, for example, the first point of contact in your company relating to VAT questions? Do you keep track of regulatory changes? Or are you yeah, responsible for e-invoicing solutions? So I think we're now a little bit in the middle of everyone that uh, is voting. I will maybe just share my point of view. What I see in the US is that the type of responsibilities that are being managed out of the US is tax technology solutions, especially global tax technology solutions. We see that it's a tax department in the US that likes to centralize a VAT calculation. And to do that, it acquires a, a tax engine that then manages, uh, for example, out of the US. So that's one of the items we see taking place in the US. I also see that often there is a lot of, uh, between the tax directors, together with IT, they take responsibility to manage e-invoicing solutions. Similar reason, e-invoicing solutions is also a global platform for which uh, then together with IT, it's IC it's being managed here out of the US. Now, let me just, uh, or if you could share the, the results, please, Michelle, then I think everyone responded. And yeah, what do we see? Well, we see that for the, Folks that joined the call today, 60% of them manages or have responsibility on a tax technology solution. That's great. This is a very then good uh, webinar for you. Besides that, we see actually the VAT reporting and being the first point of contact within your company being very close. So it's great to see that we also have uh, folks on the line that takes care also of the advisory and, and VAT aspects when it comes to uh, reporting, compliance, and also when it comes to uh, general ad hoc questions that you might get from the business when business changes are taking place, for example. 
Thank you again for uh, completing the poll. Let me then go to the next slide and uh, give some background more about a text engine for VAT. So what I'm showing on the screen is, I would say, a, a text engine that fits the Vertex. That's one of the solutions that Vertex provides. But I'd like to go through it more in generally first, and then we go into more detail on how the Vertex solution works. So if, if you think about um, transactional data that's going through your ERP, that's transactional data that's being generated out of a sales order, a billing document, a purchase order, a, fence, a vendor invoice, and it all together is then posted on the a financial posting. That type of transactional data is all VAT relevant data that requires a VAT calculation. So what we see often is that that transactional data, it's posted, is booked from a financial point of view, is booked from a, from a trans transactional slash logistical point of view, but it doesn't always take into consideration uh, the, the tax data elements or the VAT regulatory requirements that we would like to include here to ensure that we get the right tax calculation. To give you an example, we often see that if you look at uh, triangulations, so ABC transactions that in SAP or in Oracle, the ship from is booked out of party A and the ship two is booked out of party C. But then as party B, you also have to file and calculate your taxes. Party B doesn't always mention the right ship from. It also mentions the same as party A, which is not always the right ship from that we want to think about from a pure regulatory point of view. And because it doesn't show the right ship from, you initially also get the incorrect tax calculation if you knew native SAP, but you initially would also get incorrect tax calculation if you use out of the box uh, tax engine solutions. So for that, and going back to what uh, Vertex offers, for that, you can see that Vertex came up with a specific solution that's called the Vertex Chainflow Accelerator that we explain here on the left bottom. It's a solution that's actually installed within SAP and activated within SAP. And part of the solution is to ensure that the logistical data, the financial data within SAP is mapped to tax data elements that are, that are, that are necessary according to the VAT law. When you do that match, you actually get into a, a lot more cleaner data that can then be read easier by, for example, a tax engine. But the, the accelerator also helps with a text code mapping. And what's very helpful for a solution like that is that it looks, it gives you a visual representation on how the transaction looks like. Uh, if you, one of the other scenarios that we often see going uh, wrong too is, uh, if, is uh, consignment transactions, that you actually need to know exactly how the consignment has been set up in your system in, in ERP to ensure that you then can pull up the right data fields that are necessary to, do, to make a calculation. So if to, to double check first, if it's set up correctly, that's how you can open the chain for accelerator, look at the visual representation on how consignment has been set up in your solution. And from there, uh, map the data fields that you need to actually uh, map them to a text data field that gets into a, a clean data set. And then if you think at point three and four, when you have a clean data set that can then be transferred to via the interface, the SIG environment or Vertex, if you transfer that via the interface to the tax engine, if you think about what a tax engine is, it has several components. It has a component that is uh, tax content. So an engine, you can see that all the laws globally has been calculated and configured into an engine so that it knows exactly when it's a domestic supply, when it's an export, when it's a type of service, a financial transaction, all that content together, when clean data is being sent over to an engine, it will then know exactly to make the right calculation. And based on that calculation, it gives back data into the ERP. And that's data that the ERP uses to then come up with the right SAP tax code or Oracle tax code. And as you might be familiar with, those tax codes are very important. If you think about, you still want to use SAP or Oracle reporting, or that as tax code also triggers your invoice templates and those tax codes also trigger um, your, your financial postings. So I hope that gives everyone a, a, a high level understanding 
on how an engine works, whereby if I would summarize it, first is really looking at the data that's being poked in SAP. If that data doesn't match to what you like to see from a text point of view, you can use the chain for accelerator to enhance that data set, fix the correct the gap if there is a gap so that you can send clean data to your tax engine and use out of the box functionality from the tax engine to, to make a tax calculation. Is there anything you'd like to add over here, Pete, uh, Peter? No, I think this is a, this is a very good um, uh, overview. And what, what I always um, find very attractive in a tax engine is that, and you already mentioned it, that the whole content part is um, already part of this automation. So you don't need to worry about um, gathering and implementing a relevant tax content and embedded in your various ERP systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And that gets us also to the next slide then, maybe to talk a bit about the comparison between native systems and, and Vertex. Yeah, that's, um, uh, that, that's, that's always interesting if you, if you compare those and this is indeed a comparison, a high level comparison between um, some of the differences between what a tax engine, the Vertex tax engine can do and where native SAP um, yeah, is more difficult to, to manage. And it already starts with, with the implementation, um, especially if you have um, multiple ERP systems. Within a native SAP system, you need to code your um, VAT requirements um, and especially the more complex transactions in, in, in your local language, why it's already embedded in your, um, in, in your tax engine. Um, it also, uh, a tax engine has the advantage that it squeezes out um, human errors because in case of non-compliance or incorrect data, um, the least you will get is a warning but as a, as a tax manager, you can also decide, well, okay, for specific transactions, I would actually prefer uh, a block. Um, scalability is also an aspect that um, we, we uh, highly favor for, for a tax engine because a tax engine, you can connect one single tax engine to multiple systems. So you have harmonized tax process across multiple systems, and that does not necessarily only need to be ERP, but that can also be your, your procurement system or your e-commerce system. And at the same time, it's also scalable if you are quite active as a business in your um, M&A uh, activities. It's relatively easy to add an additional ERP system or multiple ERP systems to that specific tax engine. Um, while if you want to standardize your tax processes in this newly acquired businesses in native SAP, you will have to do a lot of checks and recoding before you uh, reach that state. So that's a few highlights that I wanted to share about um, the comparison. There's, there's multiple and if you dive into the details there's a lot more to discuss, and it's also, um, yeah, it also depends on your business and your and your systems landscape and your your IT capabilities. What um, is is most important for uh, for you specifically? Yep. And yeah, if if you think, well, okay, yeah, actually, this all sounds pretty nice and, and Angelo have explained what, what high level a tax engine can do. I've explained a bit about the differences, but as a tax manager or a VAT manager, you can be enthusiastic about, uh, about these solutions, but in a business environment, you're not alone. There are multiple stakeholders. And if you can go to the next slide, Angelo, there are multiple stakeholders in an organization um, that actually impact your capabilities and, and your options when selecting a tax engine. And the difficulty is that also every stakeholder that you have to deal with has a different angle, has different priorities, has a different strategic and operational agenda and faces specific issues. Peter, if I might, I, I apologize for interrupting. We did have a question in the Q&A and the question was, what is for HANA? 
And I believe they're referring to the S4 HANA of, of SAP, but I'll let you uh, answer that question if you would, please. Can you elaborate on that, Angelo? <laughs> yes, there's yeah. just a question that's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Angelo. Yeah, I think with that is meant S4 HANA, which is SAP's latest uh, solution that uh, is the upgrade of EC6. That's right now in the coming years being out, uh, rolled out to S4 HANA. But please go ahead, Peter. Yeah, thanks. I hope that answers the question. And otherwise, please um, uh, fill in additional questions in the Q&A. Um, if you look at the, the, the stakeholders and, and their agenda, on a high level, there are three um, objectives and, and benefits of, of having VAT automation. Uh, the first one is keep us out of trouble. The second is to make your business better. And the final one is to look into the future and future-proof your business. And if you look at keep your, your business out of trouble, that's mainly related to um, risks, risk appetite, errors made in your, in your processes, and the risks that you are being caught when, when you are audited. And yeah, every business and every CFO um, has a different business appetite um, and yeah, the rules are, are quite confusing, um, are often also difficult to understand by business. Um, but yeah, as soon as you got an audit and it becomes a real apparent issue, then it becomes uh, important and becomes top of mind. Then if you look at the second box, make your business better, is more about efficiencies. So you can have more efficiencies um, in, in your VAT processes, and that also includes IT if you have a tax engine. Um, you can have optimized controls. I already mentioned the VAT manager can gain back control. Um, you eliminate or, or minimize the, the, the human error when processing sales or purchasing transactions. So your overall efficiency becomes better because you um, are more into a first time right kind of processing. But the difficulty here is, of course, well, OK, what's your starting point? How inefficient are you in, the, in those processes? And most businesses do not measure that. And for example, if you look at your AP process, correct VAT coding of, of incoming invoices quite often is not part of their of their KPIs. Um, so it's difficult. You, sh you should already start measuring that at an early stage and not at the moment when you want to implement uh, a tax engine. And then the final box is future proofing your business, look into the future. And um, yeah, SAP has announced that all SAP customers will have to move to this S4 HANA, this new um, ERP platform that they will introduce in the next five to 10 years. And they've already um, changed the deadline um, a, a couple of times. So it's not sure whether it will be closer to five or whether it will be closer to 10. But at a certain time, it will happen. Um, there's also been communication about a definitive VAT regime in the EU, which would be an overhaul of the current VAT system. That was actually scheduled for around, let's say, this period between now and, and five years, but it's becoming silent in the EU and there are many people that say, well, okay, it's actually not coming and the EU is focusing on other things. And finally, e-invoicing. Um, you see Italy has introduced a clearance model in Latin, it's quite popular, um, but to what extent will that be expanding in, 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 in Europe? Um, it, it's clear France has announced introduction in 2023, Poland will do the same, um, but also countries like, for example, Germany and Belgium have said, well, okay, we are actually actively looking into this. So this future proofing, yeah, it's uncertain, um, but it will come. The only thing is, when will it come? So it can help your business case for building a, a tax engine a business case 
but it can also slow you down if your CFO says, well, okay, but this, I have a five year horizon and most of this will only kick in um, in the next 10 years. And when having conversations, you also have to realize that on all of these three levels, there are many arguments in favor of VAT automation. And being part of a, of a tax engine organization, we tend to focus on those aspects. Okay, what's positive on a tax engine? But there are also a lot of um, counter arguments that you can be confronted with if you try to sell this internally. For example, a bad tax audit for one entity in a, in a specific country does not automatically imply these errors are the case for all entities as they have different people, different systems and different processes. And an internally identified issue in your VAT numbers, so processing incorrectly, does not automatically imply this is the case for all entity. Oh, so, sorry, does not automatically result in tax audit corrections and especially not in penalties. So a potential 5 million impact that you identify as a, as a VAT manager with a 0% likelihood will receive little attention from your CFO. And if you look at the efficiencies, if you say, well, okay, by implementing a tax engine, we can have a 25% reduction in FTE as a result of more effective and efficient tax processes, that does not result in a tangible and monetizable benefit if each employee involved only does tax activities for 5% of his time, because then they will just stay in their roles. And finally, like I said, the future is by definition uncertain. Um, so how likely is the definitive FED system and how likely is the rollout of e-invoice clearance in Germany? So that's the uncertainties and, and, and possible angles that might be used by um, stakeholders in your organization to tackle your, um, your business case. So because of this and because of the huge amount of data that, um, that also that you need, um, we notice in practice that many um, VAT managers, especially, but also many businesses, if it's if already more people are involved, they are struggling with building a business case for indirect tax automation. And to support those, those people in this journey, as Vertex, we've developed a seven-step approach to assist with building the financial business case. In this, we first identify goals in line with how business case is evaluated in that specific company. We agree on the approach, the timelines, which stakeholders should be part of this project. And then the next steps involve data gathering and filling out the calculation model. And as some data may be difficult or time consuming to gather, we agree on assumptions. And then the raw data results are discussed and we produce a finalized business case report. But in this approach, we also discuss and include the intangible aspects of a business case around key stakeholders and operational and strategic agendas. And that combination of intangible and tangible uh, aspects um, yeah, should help in, in building a business case and, and, and selling it internally to uh, the people that ultimately need to sign off. So then with that, uh, let's go to our next polling question. What is your biggest challenge for tax technology implementation? Is that explaining the need, why you need a tax engine, or trying to find the funding? Uh, have a lot of conversations with other clients at the moment that they uh, need to find budget to actually implement a tax engine. Is that uh, point number three, acceptance by IT, that IT pushes back on new technology to be connected to their ERP? Or is that the last point, uh, other company priority projects? Do you feel like Peter was describing that uh, a tax technology is not the number one priority and therefore um, clients actually, uh, stakeholders needs to focus on, on other projects first. I'll give it a few more minutes. We have almost everyone's uh, input, but maybe Peter, would you mind sharing what, which biggest challenge do you normally see? Yeah, it's, it's, 
it, it's it's funny because it's actually a combination of, of all of these. Um, first, if you look at it from a European perspective, um, yeah, having a tax engine for, for indirect tax automation is not as common as in the US. So you really need to mm-hmm. um, explain, well, okay, what are the benefits? Um, then also, let's say acceptance by IT uh, is important. It has to fit into the, the overall landscape. And it's actually, it's quite simple. If, if IT does not want the solution or has a preference for um, something else, then in many organizations, uh, their stake is quite high and it will not help. Um, funding is, is a challenge, but that has to do with, with your stakeholders. So you need to know, well, okay, who within your organization has the budget? In what kind of larger project does it fit or would it best fit? For example, an s hana deployment in an organization is an excellent environment to say, well, okay, now we are also going to include um, a tax engine. But indeed, I've also seen um, yeah, many, many situations where an organization says, well, okay, yeah, it's interesting, it's appealing, we see the, that, that it's interesting, um, but we first have to deal with other priorities. And that could, for example, be, yeah, we, we see a tax engine, but if you have crappy data, um, you get crappy output. So we first need to do a data project. Um, sometimes they also see, well, okay, we have an, an, an SAP project and we do not want to add additional complexity uh, to this. So we wait with the implementation of a tax engine until we've implemented the SAP. So there are many, many arguments, Angelo, um, that that pose a challenge. Yeah, yeah, no, you see that coming back in all the responses whereby the biggest at the moment is the company priorities that they have to focus on other, I guess, hot items within the company than setting up a tax engine. Thank you all again for submitting your result, your polling results. Um, let's go to the next phase of this uh, webinar. Let's go through in more detail about implementation considerations. And yeah, I saw during the Q&A a question being asked about um, whether, oh, sorry, let me go back here whether this um, whether Vertex imp- uh, solution is only applicable for SAP or whether it's applicable for other ERPs. Well, Vertex has a lot of connectors for different ERPs. They have connectors for Oracle, for Dynamics, for Workday. So it's definitely not only uh, applicable for SAP, but uh, yeah, I saw that question passing by. I just wanted to, to share that. Then when we look at implementation considerations, we wanna go through the general approach that we see in the market and different phases. How do you scope such an implementation? Talk a bit about the the key aspects of an implementation and also the pitfalls. So we'll go through this uh, a little bit slowly. There's a lot uh, that I'm sharing right now on my screen, but we'll just go through it step by step as I see that we have good time to do that too. So if you think about an implementation approach, uh, we often see uh, different models being used, a waterfall model or an agile model. Um, in the end, it, it results in that you still have several phases that needs to be completed during an implementation. And we see those phases being a planning phase, a requirement and design phase, an installation and configuration phase. After that, you test what's being configured after testing, you ensure that training is provided and there is go live support after that's hypercare. So if you go into that into more detail, what do we mean with that? So during planning, you work on the project plan and you also review the RACI. RACI is very important in these type of implementations because you often have different, several parties involved. You can think about from a client side that you have client IT as it relates to a tax technology solution that needs to be 
uh, connected to the ERP. There's an IT aspect there. You also have the client business team that actually needs to help identify all the different uh, requirements and business uh, scenarios that are applicable for your company. Then you have the client's tax department that, uh, like we saw in the previous polling question, is the, the biggest stakeholder for tax technology. And they need to ensure that because it's also their solution in the end that is being implemented correctly. And then you have other parties involved, for example, like Peter was describing, if it relates to an upgrade from an ERP, then you would also have an IT implementer involved who actually does the act, who actually does the, the, the upgrade. Or if there's maybe a change from ERP, you go from uh, Dynamics to uh, JD Edwards or from uh, JD Edwards to Workday. That will then uh, include also an IT implementer who assists the clients with that uh, change of ERP. They also have, have a role to play within this type of tax implementations. They'll go through in a second more in detail, but they're part of the RACI. And then you have two more parties. That's then the, the tax engine implementer. Uh, DMA implements tax engine, for example, and then DMA will play a role in the RACI. But you also see that uh, the tax engine solution provider, uh, in this case, uh, for example, Vertex, they also play a role in the RACI, especially if their solution is to be upgraded for any reasons to during the implementation. So there's a lot going on during planning and especially the RACI is very important. After planning, we go through the requirements and design phase. That's actually a phase that you capture all the tax requirements and those tax requirements are um, being captured together by working with the client business, by working with cl uh, client tax team to ensure that when you have captured all those requirements, you can by tax assignment design the configuration. Angela, we have a question in the Q and A. Sure. Does Vertex Tax Solutions cover foreign trade scenarios, import and export? Yeah, definitely, definitely. But but we have to make the distinction between are you looking for foreign trade scenarios from a global trade point of view or VAT? Well, you do an export from a VAT point of view, you do an import from a VAT point of view. That's all being covered by the Vertex uh, tax engine that we just we were just referring to. Now, to continue what I was explaining, so you, when you capture all these tax requirements, per tax requirement, you will design the, 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 the Vertex solution. You will design uh, how it should be configured. Uh, part of that design is thinking about your requirements, will it be met by out of the box solution? Because as you guys uh, know, uh, an engine has content and has functionality. And when that content and functionality, a lot of the tax requirements can be covered automatically and can be covered out of the box. But sometimes we see when you go through these implementations that, that depending on how the ERP was set up, depending on specific scenario from the client, there might not be an out of the box uh, uh, solution available. And when that happens, then you often see that customized uh, configuration is necessary within the tax engine. But that's definitely part of this, uh, what we describe here as gap analysis during the requirements and design phase, that you really know how will every requirement be captured? And so will it be out of the box or will there be a gap and therefore there is a customized uh, configuration necessary? After that's designed, we get into the installation configuration phase. Um, in this case, we're referring to the Vertex uh, uh, solution. So yeah, you will configure the Chainflow Accelerator for Europe and the Vertex O-Series for Europe. Besides that, you will also, like we explained, that you need to have the connector, which is the integration between ERP and uh, Tax Engine. That needs to be installed and configured to make sure that it works. And like I explained, when the connector has been configured, data has been passed on to the tax engine, tax engine does the calculation and then tax data passes data back to, uh, tax, tax engine pass data back to the ERP. That's where you also have to work on setting up the tax code, the GL accounts, the reports, in case you like to use that in ERP. What we see as part of these type of projects is that then during a configuration, a, a, a configuration document is created so that it's very clear for the client uh, what has been configured. And the client then also looks at that, signs off on that and, and trains its super user on that. 
So after installation and configuration, we get to the testing phase. That's where we then, uh, what we work with your client, when you think about what type of transactions do you want to actually test to ensure that what has been configured can be uh, tested properly, make sure that everything is working well. And then we see that also the tax engine implementer then uh, assist the clients with their defect resolution. So during testing, during SID or UAT, if the right tax calculation is not uh, coming out of, out of a tax engine, then, do it, then the tax engine implementer will help you by working together with tax engine provider or by working together with the IT implementer to figure out the root cause. And based on that root cause, then uh, look at uh, what's necessary, what, what's the fact, what's the defect and how can we fix that? Well, in the meantime, I saw another question coming up, which is what's the global coverage of Vertex? Would it be able to calculate inner taxes for subsidiaries in Europe, India, South, East Asia and Brazil? Well, the answer is yes. And I was going to go through that in a bit more in my next slide. But yeah, the answer is that that content that's available in, in a tax engine solution, such as Vertex, Vertex can cover different types of regions. Then after testing, we have training. Training very important being that uh, your stakeholders within tax that are planning to uh, manage the solution after go live, they need to be trained properly to be able to manage the solution after go live. So, and then after that, we have the go live, where you often see there is a 30 day or two months uh, hypercare support that's being provided to clients to ensure that if anything doesn't go well during the first two months, that can be looked at and, 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 and solutioned for. Then part of the implementation approach is really think about your key scope considerations. We have these discussions often with clients that you have to think about, do you want a tax engine for your accounts payable or for your accounts receivable, or do you want it for both? How do you want, this, how do you want your tax engine to be connected? Should only be connected to your ERP? And do you have multiple ERP? Some clients we see that because of uh, m and deals that they actually have divisions that have a Dynamics and another division has uh, uh, Oracle. So, but if you want to put, want to have both divisions into the same tax engine, well, you have to build that connector, which, which is available. So it's important to think about in your scope, how many different ERPs are you planning to connect to a tax engine? And then also if you want procurement solutions like Coriba, Cuba or CMR solutions, to also be directly connected to your tax engine. That all matters because these, connector, these connectors needs to be set up. You need to test if the data is coming over from those solutions well to the tax engine. So it's all part of your scoping to think about. Then when it comes to uh, tax calculation itself, we have, we have seen that some clients just want the standard processes to trigger tax calculations, so such as sales order process or purchase order process, but manual processes or direct FI postings, they rather do that themselves and not have it gone through an engine. So that's also a, a scoping discussion when you go through this type of implementation that what type of trigger or what type of transactions do you want uh, it to be called out to, to an engine. Then the last two points when it comes to scoping are very, very important. The first one is to think about yeah, when it's VAT, it's not only tax calculation, but it's also thinking about yeah, which reporting functionality do you use for your compliance purposes? Well, and tax engine provides standard reports that you could use for your compliance purposes. But if you don't want to use that, then you could also use the ERP reports. So that's also part of, of your scoping. And then the last point, and that's one that we always discuss with clients that comes up many times because it's a time consuming point, is when you think about capturing tax requirements, yeah, how is that actually being done and who signs off on those tax requirements? Is that signed off by the client because they have a comfort that they know their tax requirements very well and therefore they can just collect it together with a tax implementer, but uh, the tax technology implementer, but they, the client is signing off, or is it that they want the tax technology implementer to sign off the requirements because the client's not very comfortable what they have right now in the system. The same with testing. Is the client comfortable enough to perform testing themselves? Or do they feel that the tax technology implementer should be the one that's providing the testing because they have a lot of experience on with respect to VAT, but they also have a lot of experience on how, how that technology solution works. 
So these are different considerations for you to think about when you go into such an implementation. Then let me go now to the next slide and give you a bit, a bit about the key implementation aspects that are relevant when, you, when you're thinking about implementing an X engine. Because of time, I won't go through them all one by one, but, um, Oh, sorry, Angela, there is another question. Yes, there is another question. So is it also possible to implement a tax engine for manual accounting package, manual Excel uh, journal entries? Yeah, that is possible because you have also a, a pro uh, besides making a direct connection, you could also work with a batch uh, process. So it really depends on when you describe manual Excels. It sounds that that's just being kept, that information be kept in Excel and then in a batch process needs to be uploaded into the engine so that you get the result back. So in essence, yeah, that should be possible. Then going into the, the, the key implementation aspects. So I'll, I'll touch base on a few ones over here, but the general message here is that when you implement a tax engine, there are four key areas to consider and all those four key areas is, is are as important as the other. One is thinking about your business processes. So within your company, uh, your team, your, so your business team or your tax team needs to know very well what's the operating model that you guys are applying, what are the tax, tax, tax touch points within order to cash procurement to pay and record to report that, de that defines how VAT is passing through your, 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 your processes and master data. It's very important in your business processes because you have to set up and have the right mass of data as it impacts your VAT calculation and VAT reporting. From a tax advisory point of view, we touched base on that already, that you have to ensure that you calculate all the VAT requirements that are then configured into the tax engine. But there, one additional point that we see as, as a suggestion when you go through these projects is that since you're getting all this information already that shows you exactly what's taking place within your uh, environment, within your business, that same data you could use to do a, a VAT exposure analysis and see if you have an exposure, but that same data you could also use to see if you have not reclaimed all VAT that you could actually have. And there we see a lot of opportunities because if you focus on that area that there is more, there's VAT reclaim possibilities, that part of it could actually pay the project because you're asking for VAT back from the tax authorities that you identified by going through this project. Then from a tax technology solutions point of view, very important. There are just a few things that I want to highlight here. One is vendor selections. It's very important that you compare the different tax solutions because yeah, they have all different content capabilities. Some cover some uh, regions better than others. But it's also important to look at the tax engine providers, what type of connector they have with different ERPs because some uh, tax engine providers have a certified connectors and others don't. So it's good to know then, yeah, with what type of uh, solution you expect to deal with. And, I, and as last point, when it comes to vendor selection is really the functionality. We see that the functionality by tax engine can differ a bit. So it, it depends on what, what you look, what are you looking for as a business? As last point, when it comes to the ERP integration, I'll mention there that the connector is something that could not be underestimated. It's something that makes sure that the data speaks passed through correctly. And it also ensures that there is the right performance between the between ERP and Vertex. We sometimes see that, yeah, without a stress, stress test and you go live, that uh, there is some latency issues because the connector was not set up correctly. Let me go through the next slide and just pick a few uh, pitfalls of when you go through, especially a, a, a European implementation. One is first that uh, we see that European IT implementers, so no tax technologies implementers, but pure IP like an Oracle or JD Edwards implementer, they're not always very familiar with a tax engine. So we see that sometimes we need to have more discussions with them to ensure that they also know how it works. At the same time, we also see that uh, clients uh, sometimes have the different expectation when it comes to a tax engine because if you think about VAT requirements, there are many different ones and not all of them will be captured or solutioned for doing a tax engine. There are a lot of other VAT requirements that are actually needs to be captured and solutioned for in the actual ERP. 
So it's making that distinction, knowing what will be solution by your engine compared to which tax requirements will be solution by your ERP. That also uh, really matters here. Then as last point I'll mention here that, like I said before, that, that VAT data is really, is really important. And we see that one of these pitfalls is, is that the business processes has not been set up well and you, not all the right data is available for calculation. And we do want to thank, uh, I know we only have a minute left, but I do want to thank Angelo and I do want to thank Peter very much for, for joining us today uh, and taking us through the implementation of, of that. Um, we will stay on for a few minutes to see if you have any additional questions, but want to thank everyone who's attended today. Uh, again, thank you to our speakers and we look forward to uh, seeing you on a future webinar. Have a great day, everyone.